Okay, I think it's four o'clock. We'll go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, thanks for coming, joining us in person and online. My name is Jamie Wittenberg. I'm head of the scholarly communication department and research data management librarian here at the Indiana University Libraries. I'm also the project director for the Cadre Project, um, which is what we're here to talk about today. I'm gonna give you all a five minute-ish high level overview and then I'm going to pass things off to Val. So I wanna talk a little bit about why we are developing this platform, the Science Gateway. Research libraries have historically had a research data problem. Many of us are purchasing large licensed data sets for our research communities, but few of us actually have adequate infrastructure to support it. It's not just about storage, about where we put the data sets, but it's also about access. How do we get the researchers to the data in a way that facilitates exploration and advances their research while implementing the requirements in our data use agreements. Many of our researchers have text and data mining needs that aren't being met because we haven't been able to provide consistent standardized access to resources. There are a few reasons for this. One of the big ones is that for many licensed data sets in high demand, we can't just purchase it and put it on a shelf like a textbook, right? We need to run annual updates, curate the data, implement authentication to ensure that only affiliated patrons can get to it. Um, in some cases, we have to review any derivatives that researchers create. This requires both expertise and technology, and neither of those things are cheap. It's just not financially feasible for most research libraries to build and staff an enclave, hire a data steward, run complex updates regularly, and work with researchers to analyze data sets effectively without violating the terms of a license. This is true of licensed data sets and of large open data sets, data sets too big to download and analyze on the average computer. Typically, when researchers do work with these large data sets, the only way to really do it is to code or to build their own databases. These resources aren't often accessible to researchers that prefer or are only able to do research using a graphical interface um, or don't have the ability to analyze a data set in, say, Python or R. So this means that the majority of our users cannot actually use these resources, even if it would advance their research. So IU, uh, in collaboration with many others, decided to address this problem. We wrote a proposal to IMLS and asked for funding to build a shared solution. We call the solution CADRE, the Collaborative Archive and Data Research Environment. While it's not feasible for individual libraries to build out large data support in the way that I described, we think that as a community, it is possible. And a lot of people were interested in being involved. So right now we're working with libraries in the Big Ten Academic Alliance because we're seeding the platform with a data set that has a consortially negotiated license. The project is led by IU Libraries, the IU Network Science Institute, and the BTAA with support from the libraries at Iowa, Michigan, Michigan State, Minnesota, Ohio State, Penn State, Purdue, and Rutgers, along with three out of the four big data hubs, Microsoft Research, and Clarivate Analytics. What we set out to do is build a science gateway in the cloud that can support a range of licensed and open data sets. So libraries that license the same data set can simply log into the platform and have immediate unfettered access to those resources without worrying about updates, hosting the data, hiring the expertise, enforcing use agreements. We wanted to make it effortless for users. We're seeding the platform with two major bibliometric data sets. Web of Science data and Microsoft Academic Graph. Both of these data sets are important to researchers in information science and science of science communities, among others. The Clarivate Web of Science data set enables us to pilot the platform with a large license data set, and the Microsoft Academic Graph data set enables us to pilot it with an open access data set. Because we're building this as a community, the cost is a fraction of what it would be to provide this kind of service alone. And because we have support from research libraries with the most active users, 
it allows us to provide a free tier of service as well. This free tier will be available to anyone with an EDU email address, even if their institution doesn't license one of the data sets on the platform, this tier of users can use the open data sets that are available, like Microsoft Academic Graph, and an open suite of tools to analyze this data. So anyone will be able to use this platform, not just researchers who are expert in navigating big data sets. We're building a graphical user interface as well. And this really opens bibliometrics research to everyone. Users will be able to query the data sets and do their analysis within the platform, in the cloud. The environment will have a suite of tools for analysis preloaded. And when they're done, users will be able to save their queries and push their derivatives to a repository for collaboration or dissemination. And one of the really exciting things about this platform is that users are going to be able to search across multiple data sets within the environment. So we've already um, made the Clarivit data and Microsoft Academic Graph data available uh, to search across as a collection, uh, which means bibliometrics researchers have a significantly larger source of citations to work from without needing um, to spend the time and expertise doing this themselves. This is a two-year uh, IMLS-funded project, and we're working on a sustainability model for the future. We'll have a tiered membership model for research libraries and other organizations with higher tiers providing additional features, uh, maybe integration with local computing resources, more cloud computing time for researchers. Um, we're collecting as many use cases as we can to figure out what that sustainability model will look like. So if you are a researcher you know is interested, please reach out to us. Um, and with that said, uh, as uh, you work your way through this demonstration and listen to um, more information on the technical infrastructure of the project, please let us know if you have any questions about how you can get involved um, or how you can participate in contributing a use case to the project. I'm going to pass things off to Valma next, who's going to get us started on the technical infrastructure. Thank you, Jamie. Uh, my name is Valentin Penchev, and I'm the IT director of the Indiana University Network Science Institute. Can we, or I'll advance my own slides. Once we get to the right slides. Okay. So first, a few words about the IU Network Science Institute, or as we call it, IUNI. The people who are familiar with the institute, we are a small and unique startup in a large educational institution that is the behemoth of Indiana University. Uh, and we're an interesting institute for those especially joining us with Zoom who are not familiar with us. It's a cross-campus transdisciplinary institute that was set up intentionally as part of no school we have no deans we don't issue degree programs and we don't have students what we do have is a faculty of various fields of science who work with us a unis mission is to strengthen the theories methods and analytical tools and practice of network science but also to foster collaboration between different disciplines and institutes and this is a prime example of our core values and mission. The unit team consists of the IT department, which I lead, and you see some of their photos here. That's Ben, Chaturi, Matthew, and Aditya, and a team of uh, research scientists, of which Shaoran, who will be following my presentation, is a member. Again? No? There we go. There we go. It, it's working now. Uh, so in this project, we identified three different constituencies. Our primary constituencies are the academic research libraries, the R1 institutions of the world, the people who are really invested in sociometric and bibliometric research. Uh, we also want to open the project to public libraries, to teaching colleges, to the small uh, to the small educational institutions who need visualization, network, and who care about the science of science. And thirdly, 
Uh, we want to open this to the general public. As Jamie mentioned, everyone who has an uh, EDU address will be able to use the cadre system. To do that, we collect user stories. We have workshops like this one. We convene product ownership councils like the one happening in Chicago in a few days. And we are able to identify different aspects of research with the data. On one side, we have the computer scientists who care about APIs, notebooks, Spark clusters, access to raw data, people who have their own labs of PhD students or developers and programmers. We're also opening to the science of science community by integrating all of this data into databases and using native cloud technologies I'll mention in the next slide in a minute. And for everyone else, the IT team is building a web query interface which will allow you to uh, submit queries against multiple huge data sets just with a few mouse clicks. So what do these people need? Again, raw access to the, to the database, to the XML files, to the JSONs, to the CSVs, use of Spark clusters, use of uh, cloud-specific uh, dynamic schema technologies like USQL, like Glue and Athena. If you know these terms, you do know what I'm talking about, this will be available for everyone with access to the platform. We also process the data into data sets and into databases, relational databases, graph databases. We experiment with multiple different technologies to make sure that the best query will be answered by uh, the, the appropriate compute resource. People who know SQL, people who know Cypher, people who know Gremlin are welcome to use the database interface. And again, for everyone else, we're building a guided query builder, which will first be able to answer the most complex network and science questions without having to touch the computers behind it. And will most importantly, try to suggest the best technology. If you're not sure, will this query be answered better with uh, a relational database or a graph database or a distributed uh, compute resource on the back end. The, the, the guided query builder will be able to suggest that and spin the right technology uh, on the back end. Being cloud will allow us to also scale to the point to accommodate everyone that needs access to the platform. Another aspect which you probably would not see here today but we, is a work in progress is the project asset commons, the research asset commons. Something that will allow federated login, so individual institutions will be able to use single sign-on to, uh, to, to join. We'll promote collaboration by letting people share their query, save their data, share the derivative results with their own teams, their institutions, or as long as the vendor licenses provide, uh, allow us with the general public. And finally, reproducibility, replicability, provenance, and transparency. Sharon will talk a little bit more about this, but everything will be set up with a DOI. Everything will have its own publication package that we'll be able to trace back to the project and results replicated. There is a small, a very quick overview of the project backend. Sharon will talk way more about this, but here are all the different kinds of storage that we plan on supporting all the different tools which we plan on building and by the way uh, allow third party to build through our APIs, the research asset commons, the web query interface and all the various computing tools all guarded by the authentication and the federated system. That's all I have to say. I will turn this to a more technical demo from uh, Matthew. Just wanted to have the, the project director team here on the board with us before we go forward. All right. Hello. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Matt Hutchinson. I'm the data manager at IUNI, part of uh, the IT staff that Val was uh, talking about. Oh, sorry. Let me get the slides up for you so you've got something to look at. Um, apologies to the people watching online. I don't think you'll be able to see me because I'm sitting over to the side here. Um, I only have a couple of slides and then we'll get on to the uh, presentation. Um, so I'm going to show you um, really two parts. Um, what we have available right now, so what you can uh, get access to and start working on and uh, start using in your own research. And then we're going to walk through a kind of proof of concept demo 
of what we envision to be the, uh, the first stages of the Cadre project as we move to this uh, cloud-based platform. Uh, so first of all, I'm going to talk about what we have currently. So some of you may be familiar, if you're part of IU, with our current system. Uh, we host the Web of Science data on this server, which we have um, as part of the CAST cluster. Uh, so as of today, we're going to begin the migration process and start moving everyone onto the new server, which I'm going to demo for you now. And um, hopefully you'll start to see uh, the advantages of the new system and what we've changed and, and how, this, how we hope this new system will improve and offer better services than we had previously. So a quick overview, um, the URL at the top there, that's how you'll log in. Um, if you do request an account for our new server, I'll send you all this information again, so don't worry about memorizing it. But uh, if you remember the old system, uh, you'll see we have significantly more storage space now, I think 21 terabytes on the new server, and then a terabyte and a half of RAM compared to our old server, which I think was only about half a terabyte. So we should hopefully dramatically improve your query times and uh, performance of other applications on the system. And this server is running Red Hat 7 compared to the old one, which was Red Hat 6. Uh, so again, hopefully I see some improvements there. So the first data set is our Web of Science database. Um, this is available, as Val was saying, both in its raw XML format on the system in the Postgres database. And then we do have a very basic sort of uh, browser-based tool you can use to run simple text queries. Uh, and I'll show you all of those in just a minute. So it's about 69 million records, currently goes to 2017. Uh, 2018 data should be available soon. We have, we have it I have it on my desk. It's not on the server yet. We're working on adding that, but it may just go straight to our cloud infrastructure as we build that out. And uh, you say we can go to our website and find all of the details about what's in the data set and how it's structured. And the other database we have available now is the Microsoft Academic Graph. So this is a product from Microsoft. Uh, they've been partnering up with us on this grant and I think it's every two weeks they give us a new update. Um, our database is not going to be updated every two weeks. We have a copy from, it's uh, January the 11th of this year, is the edition that we have on our server. Uh, but we can make, it, um, make the newer ver versions available to you if for whatever reason you'd like to look at different versions as the one we have. And you see this one is significantly bigger in terms of number of records and in the date covered. Uh, but the major difference is there are uh, fewer data points about each record in Microsoft compared to Web of Science. So Web of Science is a much broader data set. So for each publication included, we have a lot more information about that publication. Whereas with Microsoft, we have a lot more records, but less information about each one. So, um, and again, this is available on our server. So that is all my slides. And I will show, now, show you now how we can log in to the system. I already have to see my messy desktop, if I can find it under all these slides. Okay. So this is a ThinLink client, which you may be familiar with. Oh, it's not showing? Ugh. I don't think PowerPoint would be the complicated part of this presentation. <laughs> okay, well, under, under here somewhere is my desktop. There we go, okay, no? No, I can't see it. All right, this is a ThinLink client. And if you're a part of IU, you'll be able to use your um, IU credentials uh, once you have an account created. Uh, if you're outside of IU, we can offer affiliate access. Uh, it takes a little longer for us to process and set up, but the goal is that people who are part of the Big Ten Academic Alliance supporting this grant will also be able to use this system. So it won't just be limited to IE researchers. Um, the other major difference, I guess I can talk a little bit about while we're logging in. Uh, we have a change in our licensing agreement. So previously we were only allowed to offer access to employees of the university, but now we can also allow students um, access as well. So hopefully it can you know, free, free up uh, those restrictions on who is allowed to use the data. We're much more, uh, have a much more an open agreement with Clarivate, or we have a different agreement with them, I should say. So the first major change, uh, if you've used our old server, this one, if you open up a web browser, you'll see that we are actually connected to the internet. Now, this is a big change from our old system, which was completely isolated. Uh, we didn't allow any traffic in or out. Um, the goal or the concern with the old system was that under our old licensing agreement, we weren't allowed, or we had to be very protective of what data was shared in case large amounts were leaked possibly online or there were some other security vulnerability. And so we had to cut off from the network and the only person who could import and export data was me. So people had to email me and say, please export this file and I would export it for them. And obviously this was a a roadblock and slow down a lot of people's work. Um, and obviously took up a lot of my time as well. So uh, fortunately now with our new agreement, which was negotiated as part of the Big Ten Academic Alliance, 
uh, security requirements are different in this environment, and so we can allow uh, web access, which also means you can you know, SSH to the server and you can bring in files and export data yourself. Uh, we are going to be monitoring fairly closely everything that's happening, partly for security, but also because we want to understand what it is people are using the data for and what's happening on the server. Uh, so um, there'll be you know, fairly, we'll be logging sort of all the queries that are run and all the traffic coming in and out, um, but not because we're spying on you, but because we're doing it for a good reason. <laughs> so to access the database, we have a couple of different ways to do it. I'm going to briefly show you the command line interface. I know not everyone uh, likes to work at the command line, so I won't spend a lot of time on it. But we do have psql installed. Uh, and so once you have your credentials, you'll be able to set up a password file and access the data. And what you'll see, so we have one database called core data, which is the only one, which is the one which is going to contain the uh, read-only version of the data, which we'll be providing. Uh, when we create an account for you, we'll also create a blank user database, so that'll be under your username, and you'll have complete read, read and write access to your own database. The idea being that you can copy data from this core collection into your local one, and then you can manipulate and modify the data in your own database however you wish. Um, but we've put both data sets within one database, but in two separate schemas. And there's a couple of reasons for doing this. You see MagCore is obviously the Microsoft Academic, WOS is Web of Science. Um, but really, it means you can work on both data sets simultaneously. You aren't needing to log in and out uh, to look at each database. So I can show you. So you can start running you know, SQL queries here. Oh, I'm sorry. What did I do wrong? Oh. There we go. So you can see these are all the tables we have for Web of Science. Uh, if you're familiar with the old schema, you'll know, you know you'll be familiar with this one. We haven't changed it significantly. Uh, I just wanted to show you at the top here, we have our new interface table, which I'll talk about in a little bit. Um, but if you've used the old one, that, that'll be the main difference. You'll see this additional table in the data set. Uh, and then you access Microsoft the same way. Uh, but I, anyway, I'll move away from this and let you see the beautiful graphical interface. You don't have to look at the command line. So on the old system, we had an older version of Postgres, I think Postgres 9. Uh, now we're on Postgres 11. Um, so on our old server, we had PG Admin 3, and uh, now we're on PG Admin 4, which is a browser-based tool. So rather than starting a standalone application from the command line, you can open your web browser, and you'll see we have running the local host uh, slash PG Admin 4, and that'll give you access to the graphical uh, tool for querying and uh, accessing the database. So when you get an account, uh, we'll create a separate login. Um, unfortunately, well, not fortunately, but just the way that PG Admin 4 is designed, uh, you'll need a, a separate login information for PG admin than you will for the database. You'll need to use both of them, but hopefully, uh, again, I'll uh, document all, this is all documented and you'll be able to walk, uh, follow the instructions and hopefully it'll make more sense. So this is what you see when you connect. You'll need to come here your first time and add the connection to the database. And then I'll send you all the information with all the different fields that need to be filled out, with your username, passwords, etc. So I've already created the connection for mine over here. This is my username, cadre admin. So you'll see again here, we have our two schemas. Hopefully it can make it out. I don't know how well you can see it in the room, but online, hopefully it looks, you can see it a bit better. And we have our Microsoft and our Web of Science data. Yeah, I'll show you the Microsoft one. And we can come through here and sort of drill down and find all the different tables, you know, authors, journals, publications, papers, everything you'd be interested in. And the same thing with Web of Science. And then you'll see down here that the list, these are the different, a couple of different user databases we set up for testing of some of our stuff. And so you'll be able to find your own user database down there uh, into which you can put whatever data you might want and, and start making changes and modifying data locally there. So here's the uh, query tool. I'm going to open up a file of queries I created and just show you a couple here. Up there. There we go. All right, so I'm going to run a query here, um, searching for journals with the title uh, Scientometrics in the text. Now, you notice the uh, syntax is a little different here, and this is why I want to talk about that, that interface table, which I mentioned before. So the way we receive the data from Clarivit, uh, we see the, receive these big XML files, one for each year. Um, so we have you know, 100 different ones for the 100 years that it covers. 
Um, and within the XML file, each record in the XML file is one publication. Um, so you could think of it really um, that every XML could be collapsed into a table, right? So every field in the XML is associated with one publication. Um, but the way the database was originally conceived was to follow this XML schema, but to break it up into separate tables, um, which has the advantage of allowing you to follow, use the XML uh, documentation to sort of follow what data is in the database. But it does lead to these to queries, which can have you know, a large number of joins and filters to get to the data that you want. So in order to try and uh, ease some of that uh, process, we have taken what we, we believe are the sort of core fields, the core tables that people are looking at, and basically put them all into one big denormalized table, which is called the interface table, because as you'll see later on, it is the back end for the interface. Um, but this table has you know, a lot of different types of indexes on different fields, and it makes use of Postgres's native um, text uh, indexing tool. Uh, and so that's the uh, syntax that you'll see here. Uh, so it's slightly different than your traditional sort of like scientometrics query you might be used to seeing signed, uh, using SQL. But if you're simply doing a text search for a journal or an author or a title, then I would recommend starting with this um, as you'll get a result much faster and then you can drill down into the full database and find exactly what you need. But you'll get better performance in this case. So let me run this one. You got a lightning bolt at the top here. There we go. So you see now we've got a list of all the journals containing oh, scientometrics. So I try and do this with the touchpad is not great. Okay. Here we go. All right. So you see it gives us these fuzzy search results for all of the journals which have signed metrics in the title. Ugh, if I can get this to work. I don't know what's going on here. Well, anyway, so that. Okay. So if you need an exact search, I'll just show you this one as a comparison. Then you need to add an additional clause, which, there we go. So if you add a second uh, journal name equals signed metrics, so that'll do a second run through the query, just if you ever need to get past the uh, sort of fuzzy search you get with the text search, just add this second criteria and you can get exact matches out of the database. And then I won't run these queries since I'm obviously having some trouble here with the uh, graphical tool and the, the touchpad, I must have clicked the wrong place. But I'm gonna show you this query because this is the one I'm gonna run uh, through our interface where we're gonna look in the interface table, we're gonna look for articles from the Journal of Infometrics and Scientometrics, which you can see underneath, for author uh, Ying Ding, who's one of, our uh, one of our professors here at IU who works with this data. Let me show you, here we go. Well, anyway, so we're gonna run those queries on there, but you can, all the queries I'm gonna show you through the graphical interface, obviously you can do the same thing through the, um, uh, with SQL queries in the SQL editor at the same time. And I'm gonna quickly mention our old browser-based interface, which all should be running on here. So if you don't want to mess around with SQL queries and you just wanna look for a name or a journal, we do have this tool available running on localhost uh, and you can do text searches here as well. Um, so we're not actively supporting this one. We're now move, working on the cloud uh, tool. So if anyone is a particular Python enthusiast and would like to take this on, you're welcome to get in touch with us and continue to support this. But it is available if you'd like to, to use this uh, rather than writing SQL queries. Or at least you can start here and then drill down more with SQL later on. All right. So that's everything I wanted to show you that's available right now. You can go to our website and fill out the paperwork and we'll set up accounts for you and you can get connected to the server and start working with the data. So the next part I wanna show you is our, new, our uh, proof of concept uh, demo for our new Cadre uh, cloud environment. So this is the part you can join in if you like. Um, your URL here is uh, login.cadre.iu.edu and you're welcome to, to follow along. Uh, right now we have two different methods for authentication. You can use your institutional authentication or Google authentication. I think we have more uh, on the way. Um, though I should mention today, we're just working with the web of science data. Uh, so you will need to use an institutional login from an institution which has access 
has a license with the web of, uh, to use web of science data. So that should be all of the Big Ten uh, universities. Um, you know, if you use your Google or you use a log authentication from another institute, you'll be able to see the tools in the environment, but you won't be able to uh, actually access the data today. Uh, and that's part of this uh, you know, security and, and license enforcement that we're trying to add to the project. So let me log in here. So then it takes you to the CI login. You may have seen this on other university sites. Find your institution. I don't know if the default is Indiana or if that's just my default to that one, because I use that. Then I'm log in here. And so this takes me to my institutional login page. Let's give me a moment while I do my two-factor authentication. Hopefully. Okay. I just wanted to uh, make it slow just to make me nervous there. All right. So you see, uh, this is part of our goal. Obviously, we're in the early stages. This is our proof of concept, but we're going to be, we want to build this graphical uh, interface to sort of uh, hide the complexity of having to write SQL queries and negotiate the database so you can get into the data you know, immediately without having to, uh, to work around with the database and, and connect to our server. So we have our two tools. This is our query interface. So this is the one replacing that old uh, version I showed you running on the local host. So this is a quick way to be able to access and search through uh, the Web of Science data set. So I'm going to run, if you, uh, if you do want to follow on with the demo all the way through, you'll need to run the same query that I do, but obviously you're welcome to do queries that you want, uh, but I'm, obviously then you'll have to do the next part by yourselves. So I'm going to look for the uh, ding ding again, press the ding, and then add in a journal. down here. Oh, good point. Yeah, Infometrics is in four metrics. Yeah. <laughs> good catch. All right. So once you've set your query parameters, you can uh, preview the data uh, before you export anything. So if you look, show all available fields here, you can see all the fields uh, which are available for searching or for uh, retrieving from a search at the moment. Uh, so these are the default ones selected, but we can add a couple of others, I said title and DOI. And then if I hit get preview, we should see, scroll down. So these are all of the journals, author, all the articles authored by Professor Ying Ding, it published in the Journal of Infometrics. And you can see titles, DOIs, all this information. So I can look through here, make sure this is what I want. If I don't like it, go back up, refresh the page and run the query again and find, you know, until I get the, uh, the exact results that I want with the query editor. So I can get to this point. I'm going to submit the query. So the query is now running uh, in the background on the server. And uh, this is the job ID. Now I'll need this. It's a good idea to save this job ID because this will be the name of the file for that query result. I will check the status of the job. So yeah, if you're following along, copy this to a notepad or something and, and make sure you uh, have it available. So oh, these are my other jobs from earlier today. but. Uh, and find the one that I ran most recently in GMT, which is here, so a job's completed. So uh, I'm just going to go back and run another quick query, which you'll need to do as well if you'd like to uh, follow my demo. I'm going to look at two different journals uh, from Professor Ding and compare the two. So Ding Ding in, and then journal name. It's signed to metrics if you can see it on the cloud. And I'm just going to go straight to submit the query because I've done this a couple of times, hopefully. It should be the data I need. And then again, uh, save the, uh, the job ID if you want to access the data. Oh. All right. I should have clicked through. I'll click back here. Okay. So now the data is saved in my account. Um, and I'm going to go and open a Jupyter notebook. And so I can see here, you see all these different IDs. These are different queries that I've run. So these are the CSV files I'm getting out of the uh, um, query interface. So I went through that a bit quickly, but you go back to the same login. You see before we went to query interface, this time I'm just going to Jupyter Notebook. The first time you click on Jupyter Notebook, you may get a message saying it's not running. So there should be a button underneath that says, 
what's the text of the button? Start, start notebook or launch notebook? Start notebook. So just click that and it'll, it'll spin for a little while and then notebook will be available. So, so while you're waiting for that to start, you can follow what I'm doing and then uh, and talk to you a bit more about it. Uh, so yeah, you should just see the two files in yours. Uh, you see, I've got a couple of other things here, but I'm going to go ahead and uh, create a new workbook. I'm going to create a Python one. So now you have uh, a Jupyter, uh, empty Jupyter notebook in our environment, but it's a notebook which can access the data which we just exported using the query builder. So there is some sample code you can use. Obviously, if you want to write your own, you're welcome to. Uh, so github.com, uh, .com, not, not the IU GitHub, if you've used it before, but .com is a public repository. iuni cadre Then it's our collaborative projects. And there should be a Python script in here, yeah, called OpenSci uh, demo with a typo, uh, .py. And we're going to use that Python script. So uh, you can you know, import and export files. Today, we're just going to copy and paste just to make things simple. Uh, but you should be able to just copy code from here, import your libraries. Oh, I'm going to change the name as well. If you need to rename your file, just right up here, I'm going to call this open I could type. You see why there's a demo in the, uh, the Python code, uh, a typo. <laughs> so I'm bad at typing. Here, I'll just highlight and close that. All right, so I can start writing Python code in here and running it. Uh, once you have it copied into a block, uh, control enter or shift enter will run the block. You won't see any output from this one because it's just loading the libraries, but if you know Python or if you've used notebooks before, it should be fairly straightforward, or it should be familiar, I should say. I'm going to copy this block. Um, if you're in here, you know, in editing mode, hit escape, go to the command mode, and then B will give you a new block underneath. You don't have to use a new block, but notebooks will run all, you know, the entirety of the block in one go, so it's good to break it up so you can see that each piece is working. Uh, so if you've copied it directly um, from the GitHub page, you'll see the path here query ID here. So those ID numbers which you saved from before, this is where you want to paste it in because this is the name of your CSV file. You can rename the CSV file if you don't have the, the string, but uh, it can be, that's what I've done. Here you see, so I ran these earlier. So two of these are the ones that I ran just now as part of the demo, but I ran the same things earlier and renamed them just so you wouldn't have to watch me fumble around uh, copying and pasting them. So I can just type it in here if I can type. And then, fingers crossed, there you go. So now I'm able to read that data I got from the query browser in my um, Python environment. I'll just do the same thing for the other data set. You can see it again. Copy this block and then read the other file for the signed metrics papers. And then just change this query path. And control enter, there we go. Okay, so I have both the files loaded now, both the CSV files available to work with. So now I can start processing the data. So if you want to scroll down on the GitHub page, just grab this next chunk. Paste it in here. So this is going to uh, do some cleaning of the data, just making sure we're only looking at signed metrics because I think there's a couple that's like ISSI papers which need to be filtered out. And then we're just going to select the columns that we need and merge the two data sets and do counts by year, which uh, probably makes more sense when you see the results. So now we can see for each year how many articles were published in each journal by this author by year. And then we're going to take this table and we're going to make a visualization. So again, new block. And just copy this last chunk down here. There we go. So you can see we have a visualization. So, all, you know, pretty basic Python stuff. But the goal of this uh, demo is not to uh, amaze you with my Python programming, but rather to illustrate to you the, uh, the goals of the Cadre project, that we can have all of the data and, you know, your programming tools. Right now, we you know, support uh, Jupyter Notebooks, obviously, and the goal is to add more in the future. Uh, Sharan's going to talk a bit about some more sophisticated, more advanced tools and complex tools we're going to add into the system. Um, 
But you see within one environment, we can have this secure data, you can search and access it, and you can process and write code to visualize and manipulate and do whatever you want with the data without ever having to leave your web browser. And you know, there's really sort of, in my mind, three big advantages to doing it this way. I mean, first of all, you've got the convenience, right? That wherever you are, all you need to be able to access the data and to access all the computing power offered by the Cadre project um, is your web browser and be able to log in and find all the code and resources that you need. Um, the other one is security. And we don't have to worry about data you know, with uh, licensing agreements. We can control, you know, we can set permissions and, and manage all of that for you. And you don't have to worry about having secure data on your laptop, which you're carrying around on a flash drive or anything like that, because you know that the data is always going to be available in the cloud. And then finally, something I think Sharon will touch on as well, is this gives us the uh, environment for collaboration and reproducibility of work. And if you're a you know, subscriber, if you have access to the uh, to uh, to cadre, then you can share work. You can publish work within the environment. You can publish code and share notebooks and scripts and everything else. And that's really what we're trying to get at with this this simple demo here: how we can build tools which then integrate with these more complex programming uh, systems and, and languages, and make it all available to you in one system. So that's about it for my demo. I'm going to pass it over to Sharon now, who has. A big announcement which he's going to share with us, uh, which I'm going to tease a little bit. Let me bring up Sharon's slides. Th thank you, Matthew. That's Val again. I just want to add that if the Python code scares you yeah. or it's not enough what, what you're doing, the queries are available right away in their native CSV format and can be used by the multiple tools that you're about to build on Cadre or can be downloaded and imported in your favorite tool or in your favorite system. Yep. I think our tech team really did a fantastic job. Uh, and many of us are worried. This, uh, we hide a lot of complexity behind this. Uh, when many of us are worried this demo may not work. As you see, even simple things like slideshow, PowerPoints sometimes just you know, don't work. But we deliver it. And I think we uh, really uh, should appreciate our tech team for their hard work. And, uh, uh, and if you are impressive as I am, uh, I have right now a perfect opportunity for you to join us uh, and grow with Cadre. So I'm announcing the Cadre Fellowship Program. The program will be open today. Uh, so if you uh, go to the next slides. So by joining us uh, as a fellow, uh, you're going to enjoy a lot of free benefits you'll be gaining access to the latest uh, data sets, including Microsoft Academic Graph and uh, Web of Science that we host. You're going to receive uh, te uh, technical support and data support from our wonderful team. And uh, we also have our uh, communication channels in Slack and GitHub for you to uh, be the first to give us feedback and have your voice heard as we develop the platform. And we will be providing a lot of free computing resources on the cloud as we test Cadre. And uh, we, we also have free scholarship available right now. And uh, so here's a link if you go to that website. Uh, yeah. You can have more details of this fellowship program and uh, and how you can apply for it. <laughs> so maybe perhaps it's more easier for me to sit down here and uh, uh, start using the laptop. <laughs> yeah, should I switch to this mic here? Yeah. Hello, mic test. <laughs> So, all right. So, all you have to do to be part of us uh, is go to our IUNI resources, and there will be a page called for the fellowship program underneath Cadre. And to apply, you simply go to our application form online here, fill out. 
a proposal, uh, a, a project. So if you're planning to do your next project on big bibliographic data set, this is a perfect time to join with us. And uh, we will be selecting uh, for the first round six teams out of all the applicants uh, to work with us. The, the selection criteria will be based your research value as well as uh, how it's going to benefit our development of the Cadre platform. So uh, please read the, the specific instructions on our website and fill out the form. And uh, a particular interesting thing that we are looking at right now is we are considering uh, starting a training webinars uh, following this first round of fellows and other interested users. We'll be providing uh, seminars on topics such as data schemas and data versions that we host, uh, different query tools, languages, if you're interested in learning graph database, for example, or uh, analytics programming languages like R or Spark. Uh, so we really want your feedback on this, uh, so we can design uh, design our training material to, to fit the, the most needs that our users are seeking. I think uh, here on the uh, IU uh, conference room, we have hand out a few uh, questionnaires uh, in your hands. So please take the opportunity to fill that out. If you're on the Zoom on the internet, uh, you can join through this application form or the, we, we also have this user story collection form uh, that we have been open for a while now. So if you uh, just have generic questions or requests for features, you can submit your feedback from there. So let me now go back to the slides. So we are starting this program is because our country philosophy is really not just our, about ourselves. Uh, we are really building an ecosystem that we hope everybody will join and share their ex expertise. Uh, our, pro our, our development team will only be focusing on the cadre core part. Uh, I will be roughly uh, touch a little bit what the rack will be look, look like, which is research asset commons, where, where users like you guys will be creating your own query uh, records, your own algorithms, your own derivative data sets that can be shared among yourselves. And we're also going to be open sourcing all of our tools that we use to build Cadre so that third parties can actually run their own Cadre platform if they want to. Uh, so if you're thinking about joining us as a fellow, I actually have a few uh, uh, existing collabor collaborative projects I can illustrate today. Again, this uh, switching back and forth has turned out to be a little bit trickier. <sighs> so in the same repository that Matthew just showed you his Python code, we actually have a list of ongoing collaborative projects. Uh, if you go to the issue, you can see we've been uh, communicating with our collaborators for a long time now. Uh, there are different uh, discussions and support that we've been providing. If you look at the topics, they include things like uh, different data sets, MAG, Web of Science, different programming tools, Spark, query languages, uh, as well as resources like GPU on the cloud. So these just give you some idea that the free resources you can uh, have access to if you work with us. <sighs> so all these are public uh, communication records that, that we've been uh, working with our collaborators. So that's another sort of major decision that we made as part of the country project is we want it to be open uh, and transparent uh, almost about everything. So uh, a big consideration of this is a driving force behind the reason we're building country is about reproducibility. So again, I'm going to try to switch back to my slides here. So 
So before we go to the full reproducibility demo, uh, just give you some uh, preview of the upcoming events. So if you join us as a fellow, uh, you will be participating in many of these events. We provide free uh, full travel scholarships to attend these meetings. Uh, right now, we are at this stage of uh, Open Science Forum, and we just announced our fellowship program. Uh, but in June, uh, we will be making our first selection of the fellows. I think by the middle of June, currently planned. And we'll be starting our training webinars uh, based on your feedback today. Uh, by September, uh, we will be hosting a tutorial and a workshop at ISSI, which, is, which stands for Inf International Sensometric and uh, uh, Informetric Conference at Rome this year. Uh, so we'll be inviting six of our collaborators, fellows, uh, to present their work at that event. Uh, we'll also be hosting a cadre product owner meeting next year, and we're also planning for another big workshop at KDD potentially next year. So a lot of exciting things are coming up. So this is a perfect time for you to join us. <laughs> so, uh, so that's the big announcement I, I would like to make. And uh, to finish everything off, uh, I'll, I'll, demo, I'll give you a little bit of a demonstration of concept of how the fully fledged notebook environment on Cadre will look like, uh, and what, how can that enable you to do reproducible science? So keep in mind, this is really uh, a proof concept. None of these has, uh, is ready for pro production yet, and I don't think any of these, well, specific technologies will be employed for Cadre uh, in the final release. But just to, just to show you how Cadre as a concept can really enhance your research, in particular for reproducible uh, science. So uh, to get everything going, uh, I've created a binder image, which I'll explain a little bit uh, later. Uh, you can also go to our uh, GitHub repository. Uh, at this point, I'll finish everything, I think, almost everything on, no, not, not yet. So if you follow me here, just click on the binder link in my GitHub repository, and it will start spinning up a instance of notebook for you. So this is running not on our server currently, it's running on the public service hosted by Binder. So while the notebook is being spinning up for you, uh, let me give you a little bit more background uh, in terms of why reproducibility is so important. So right now, uh, so far, the demo has showcased three different parts uh, by Matthew. Uh, we have these databases and uh, SQL interfaces in relational database right now. So that's uh, sort of fulfilling that part of our roadmap. We also have notebooks in the cloud, which provides these analytical tools of your choice, depending on what language so Matthew demonstrated Python for the most part. So in my demo, uh, I'm gonna roughly, uh, briefly show you how R and even things like Spark can be accessed through the note notebook environment. And all of that is integrated already uh, with a gr graphical user interface that Matthew has showed you. So the missing part and this is also a big part of the country is really the research asset commons. And I'm gonna demonstrate what it's gonna look like. It's not ready yet, but we have some rough ideas. So the whole motivation behind research access commons largely driven by this reproducing crisis. Uh, if you're part of academia, you probably heard of this word multiple times. And, and as a researcher, uh, your work cycle, your life cycle, your project cycle look like, looks, looks like this. You design your hypothesis, uh, you, you design an experiment to collect data, and, and, and you conduct the data uh, on the data, and then you publish. <laughs> uh, 
But a lot of these things can go wrong and, and produce so-called the crisis for reproducibility. So in Cadre, we hope to facilitate uh, your research endeavor and make it much easier for you to produce reproducible work. So the, the demo that Matthew has just shown you really uh, covers the data collection part, because we are going to be uh, have a, a version control data set centralized at our repositories. So you can always have your access to the raw data no matter where you travel, all you need is a browser. We also provided this notebook environment where you can do analysis on the data. So this part is really, I think, researchers like you should spend your talent on and your time on. Rather than worry about the data specifics and data versions. And at the end of, uh, when you publish, that's another big area currently a lot of researchers are struggling with. How do you really, basically, when now you publish, uh, you, you cannot just only publish a paper. For, rep for reproducibility, journals like Science and many others are requiring you to publish with data and algorithm. Funding agencies like NIH are also requiring uh, reproducibility uh, constraints when you uh, use their, apply for their funding. <laughs> but it's not as simple to achieve that uh, for a lot of people. Uh, so the crisis talks about different types of reproducibility, but even the simplest one, computational reproduci uh, reproducibility, is a challenge these days, let alone you know, statistical and empirical uh, reproducibility. That's because for a lot of complicated data-driven research, especially if you uh, work with big data when machine learning, uh, getting the code to run in a complicated pipeline is a nightmare. And uh, so it, it has become such a big problem, even in the industry, uh, they are now facing the same challenge. So a lot of inspiration that we have here actually borrow from industry solutions. How can you integrate the seam seamlessly the process of getting the data, analyze the data, and finally uh, deliver the results? So how does current reproducible solution looks like. So this is my personal solution, which is not ideal. So, I, so this is from my personal website. I listed my own publication records. I, at the same time, I, I provide a link to my GitHub repository, if you're familiar with uh, GitHub. So you have to house your own code and data somewhere separate from your uh, publication paper. And it's, what, what's more is that even you provide the code, people can have a hard time running it. So I'm, I'm not sure about you, but I have having many, many troubles trying to run somebody else's code. It's either different operating system, you have different dependencies, different versions of Java, like it, it will never compile, basically, right? You have to really email the author of the things to get things to work, and even with that, it's very tricky to reproduce the exact same figure, for example, that you, you saw from his paper, his or her paper. So here's our vision of uh, on cadre and how the re uh, research access commons can help you solve this problem. So this is from our design schema. So this is this is the, none of these are live on cadre right now. This is our vision, really. So uh, as Val pointed out, uh, we will be b helping you publishing these complicated package of code and data in citable DOIs. So you can simply provide uh, the journal or, where you, or whatever reader you are intended to deliver this content using a DOI link. These DOI linked images, well, we will build a sharing marketplace where you can uh, share your code and data with your colleagues or to the public. We'll have data provenance because we house our own data from the raw data uh, on the, in the cloud on Cadre. And today I'm going to demonstrate the, the last part, which basically I, how do you containerize, so this is a latest technology called containers, uh, which allow to con basically construct virtual, virtualized environments that can run your code uh, using a simple browser. So anyone who has a browser will be able to rerun your code 
in the exact same software environment without any hot trouble. <laughs> so to follow along my uh, demo, uh, now I'm gonna switch again to the browser. <laughs> If you were in our uh, previous fellowship program, there's a link, I think, yeah, to go to our uh, collaborative issues. And here, you get, uh, if you go to the wiki page, so it's a little bit convoluted, but you can, uh, you can, just use this URL here, where I have all the code and everything that you're gonna be seeing if you have clicked the binder, binder link uh, before my, my talk. <clears throat> and your, your notebook should now be ready uh, if you click that link. So here's my version of it. So it's a familiar Jupyter notebook environment that Matthew has showed you. Uh, if, and if you look at this content, you will see it's the same content that I have on this repository. If you go to the code of this GitHub repository, it's exactly the same layout in terms of, ah, uh, sorry, it's not this one. Uh, it's this one, yeah. So you see, you're gonna see the same file structure inside the notebook as you're gonna see on GitHub repository. <clears throat> so I'm gonna to try to demonstrate a few of the features uh, rather than the detail of the code here. Uh, so first of all, uh, to reproduce everything, right now uh, you need to run a command line tool. Uh, so to do that, you have to spin up a new terminal from the uh, notebook. And if you have the wiki page here, uh, I have the detailed step-by-step -step instruction if you want to follow along. Uh, if you go to the rerun the workflow with SnakeMake, so SnakeMake is the tool I'm using right now. <laughs> and you copy these three line command, these three lines of commands and run it from the terminal You can see the code, it will be running off the bat. You don't have to change, install any packages. You don't have to uh, find the pass, file pass of the input files because I have already pre-configured everything in this image as you would when, uh, when you publish a paper. <clears throat> so while it's running, uh, those simple command is already executing uh, this workflow with multiple files chained into a pipeline. So these actually, for demonstration purposes, I have made them into Python code, R code, Java code, and a little bit of Spark code. <laughs> so just to show you how everything can be done uh, inside of a fully featured notebook environment. So I'm not gonna go into the details here. So. I'll first introduce the, uh, no, the environment of notebook called Jupyter Lab. So if you replace this tree with lab of your own uh, binder notebook environment, you will see a sort of next generation notebook environment that Jupyter has already built for you. So this is called Jupyter Lab, which is uh, probably look more similar to a fully featured development uh, IDE, the integrated development environment for you, because you have the folder structure over here. You can see all our input files, and uh, you can spin up new Python notebook or terminals as, as you as you wish. So if you sc scroll down, uh, let's see. So in our no okay, I, I haven't run the last command yet. So if I run the last command, you're going to see right now in the Jupyter Lab. We just reproduce the pipeline I have on our uh, website. <laughs> and it just been created a second ago. So this is live. <laughs> and in this environment, uh, 
I will just only demonstrate one of the R notebooks here, uh, which is this one, data transformation. So it's one of the components in this complicated pipeline. The second, the red bo uh, box. I'm just gonna run a couple of cells here. Uh, the first thing just to show you all the packages, as you see, I'm using a lot of different packages from R. But all of them are already installed. Uh, because I provide you the image to begin with. So you don't have to download all these big packages and wait for them. You can now plot this data, uh, which already retrieved for you by running my pipeline in the command. And you can do data explorations like these plotting, you know, uh, different data like Matthew just showed you. <laughs> and better yet, in this environment, you can also look at individual output data directly, in this case, like this CSV file. So it's very convenient. <sighs> and so one thing you, have, you might have noticed is in my directory, uh, I, have not, I have both the notebook file, which is with file name and with file name IPYNB, uh, but also I have the corresponding scripts of, of the same notebook. So that's another functionality I think we will be building because sometimes you would have preferred to run scripts instead of notebooks. Uh, and if for those who are more comfortable writing uh, code scripts or developing in IDEs, you can, you can try this uh, in a similar way like, uh, for example, RStudio. So this also being provided in this image. So you can go to the RStudio by spinning up a new RStudio session. So, so remember, all of these are now running in the cloud in a containerized environment. So which means anybody who is a browser will be able to do exactly the same thing that I just showed you as long as you prepare your package right. <laughs> so this is godsend for reproducibility. It's not just seeing you share your code, but it's actually let, let people interact directly with your code and your, your data. And they can actually change on top of that. So this is a familiar art studio if you prefer this environment. <clears throat> so I'm not gonna go too much details into the uh, rest of the demo here. Uh, you, can, you can keep, work, if you're interested, you can keep playing around with uh, my own dem re demo reproducibility here. And uh, just want to point it out, uh, one last thing that you, you already did by running those commands is you're not just seeing the code, you're actually seeing the exact same figure you're gonna see in the paper. So, so I prepared these pipelines to produce these visualizations that we actually are using in our paper uh, directly in this environment. <clears throat> So I think that's all I want to show with this uh, reproducibly demo. Uh, you can explore more by following my detailed instructions in this GitHub page. <sighs> but I'm gonna now switch back to our slides and wrapping up. Okay, you wanna... Yeah, just, uh, just, uh, I just wanna mention that the current reproducible images are running on Binder the server, so it's uh, not hosted by us at the moment. Thanks everyone for joining us today in person and online. We had um, quite a bit of participation. We're really pleased about that. This is our contact information. If you'd like to reach out uh, to us, if you have a use case, you wanna find out more about our fellowship program and um, sponsor travel to Rome for ISSI, uh, or if you have questions about the platform or want information about how you can um, become a part of the project, you can email us at cadre 
at iu.edu. We also have a slide in my slide deck, if you can just pull that up, Sean, um, with our other contact information. Yeah, it's that last slide there. Great. Um, and that includes our Twitter handle and our website. You can find a lot of the resources that we showed you today on that website, and you will also find a recording of this talk on that site um, as soon as we can get it up. Um, we'll uh, share the slides, slide decks that we used here today as well. Um, so with that said, um, we really appreciate your participation and we'll open, um, open it up to any questions that you have either online or in person. Feel free to use that chat box in Zoom. Thank you. Wow. Start by just sharing one of one of the questions we got from a couple of people um, on the chat for those of you who are here in person or who called in um, and so weren't able to see those um, questions in the chat box. Um, will the interface um, always be HTTP or will it be moving to HTTPS? And the answer is that it will be secure. Um, it's just not secure for the purposes of this demonstration. A couple of folks at um, BTA institutions were not able to access uh, the interface, um, so we will look into some of those uh, uh, authorization issues as well once we wrap up here. That's okay. why we do these demos. So we really appreciate your feedback if you've yeah. encountered any no, unexpected data issues. User, okay. Okay. Well, if there aren't any questions, feel free to email uh, email us at cadre at iu.edu if uh, one comes up, and I will let you go and enjoy your evenings. Thanks very much, everyone. Thank you all. This was fabulous.